Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Real pleasure of mine to introduce you tonight again to uh, a global businessman who uh, I really admire, and he sends me a uh, an article just about every day to make sure that uh, I stay up on uh, what's happening in the world. Because this gentleman has uh, has worked in Africa, he's worked in Canada, he's worked uh, in the Middle East, uh, and uh, he's uh, got... Uh, you know, arms into uh, India and Pakistan and what's going on in, the, in, in, uh, in Asia and South Asia. Um, he just knows what's happening. Uh, Nizar Mawani, how are you, sir? Very well, Brian. Thank you for having me on your show. Welcome back. Uh, so um, we talked about a whole slew of different issues that, uh, you know, you've been sending me articles about, and I know you have a point of view on. Uh, the first one that you really wanted to talk about is how the world is going to be different. Uh, post COVID-19. Tell me uh, what you think is going on and, and how is it changing our lives? I think first leadership is pivotal to see which countries, which companies are going to succeed. Uh, we've been now it's past one more than one year and we can see the impact that COVID has brought to political parties, to governments, to institutions, um, businesses, private and public. Uh, they have all been touched. Nobody has been uh, left unscarred. I think that the first place now when you look back and you'll see that the decisions, what we made a year ago, how to protect our citizens, how to protect our employees, our families, uh, you can see that COVID spared no one. And I think first and, first and foremost in this whole um, scenario is how you are maintaining uh, the public health and the cracks that it performed. The other aspect was it has catapulted the, 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 the technology sector very much on the forefront and technology is the way companies and governments operated. I think a little over a year ago, everybody was running to understand how the Zoom operates yep. and how, yep. the, how the, the trends have changed and I think that, uh, yes, people will go back to the offices, but I think people have now options, particularly women, have now options that they can operate from home, look after their families, and yet be more effective leaders in cooperations or in government or in any field that they work in. And I think that uh, in aspect of uh, the software companies have done tremendously well to, to take advantage of, of uh, speeding up things of how we operate. Um, I think remote meetings are going to be here and it's going to be here for a while. Uh, companies may share an office on a rotational basis. Uh, we'll all choose uh, to live and then work in different places and we can still perform ourselves. So you think that uh, you know, this whole move to working at home and, uh, and so many conversations, meetings, et cetera, by Microsoft Teams or Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or whatever it is, you think some of that's gonna continue? We're all not gonna go back to our offices. I think you'll have a mix of both and it all depends where you are and what field you are, but certainly the workplace is changed forever. Uh, it has given us many, many op uh, options and to become more, from a business standpoint of view, you are now more effective in actually uh, working uh, in an economic uh, uh, way of scaling costs down. Um, you'll socialize less at work and you'll socialize more in your community. That's one as, as a beginner, an advantage to finding a balance. Um, I don't think that we're gonna go back to normal for a very, very long time. And I think the next pandemic won't be as nearly as bad because we now have got the first initial shock and I think public, public, private partnerships are now forging ways of how to work uh, along those lines. We're chatting so, tonight with uh, Nazar Mawani, who is a global businessman, uh, someone who, uh, um, number one, I respect because of his business acumen and his experience around the world. But number two, is a real um, incredibly well-read uh, individual, uh, sends me an article a day um, about what's going on in the world and really 
really is aware of global uh, impacts, uh, probably better than almost anyone else that I interact with on a fairly regular basis. And so, uh, Nazar, thank you so much for uh, joining us. We're going to take a break for some messages, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to ask him about uh, about what's going on in India, what's going on in uh, in Nepal, uh, and um, and Singapore, a couple of other places where he sent me articles uh, recently. And I know he has uh, family members or business associates, and he's done business. Uh, stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour, Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with uh, Nazar Mawani, who is an international businessman um, he, he housed out of, uh, out of Mississauga, um, but uh, he's had uh, operations in real estate across Canada, um, in Africa, particularly uh, South and I guess Central Africa. Uh, and uh, he's worked in the Middle East and he's worked uh, and, uh, and has uh, connections into uh, South Asia. Um, so he's, uh, he's really extremely well experienced and uh, done business uh, and traveled uh, extensively. Uh, and he's incredibly well read. Um, and uh, Nazar, let's just do a canvas of some of the things that uh, you and I have been going back and forth uh, about in the last little while. Um, you know, one of the things that we got to talk about is India. Uh, and you and I spoke about India. Uh, and at the time, we thought that uh, India was doing well with uh, COVID-19. Um, and we were talking about some of the efforts in uh, the slums in, uh, in, um, in uh, um, the major cities in, uh, in India. And, uh, and right now, India is just out of control. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the infection rate seems to be spiraling and, uh, and, and, and death rate is huge. What's going wrong in India, do you think? I think the failure of the central government in India was a catastrophic failure. I think at local levels and the local uh, local leadership was phenomenal, but the level of support getting to the uh, from the federal government in India down right into the municipalities was the catastrophic failure. And I think that this goes to show uh, how fragile democratic countries uh, are operating under. They were to begin with in a very fragile state before the COVID period. And you know, as, as we were all looking at India and China, scaling uh, leaps and bounds on the economic side, but uh, there were a lot of gaps that uh, COVID has shown, particularly in the healthcare side of the marginalized societies. And I think that uh, uh, one has to understand that it's not easy to manage 1.2 billion people. So I have a lot of sympathy for the leadership there, but certainly, they took it very lightly. Uh, early in January, February of this year, they uh, waved their hands and said it's victory. Um, around the corner, COVID is going to be conquered. And I think that, that that kind of statement and that kind of attitude and mindset uh, throughout the global, many countries uh, lived, in that, lived forward in that direction, making decisions uh, early and even now, if uh, one or country is not careful, I think that uh, COVID is dangerous. Uh, it is coming to different forms uh, and it will continue to change. I think some countries are at third wave and other countries are even beginning at fourth wave. Yeah. You can so, see- So declaring, declaring victory too early has always been a real risk and uh, clearly has, uh, has shown again whether it be in uh, the United States or, uh, or Ontario or, or India or wherever, Brazil, et cetera, declaring victory and opening up uh, too, uh, too easily, too quickly um, is clearly a mistake. Um, but Modi, um, you know, a year ago, popular, popularity was, you know, sky high. And he seems to really, because of the, you know, the issues that you're talking about, really come into question. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, um, from business school is from India and he uh, posted a cartoon on Facebook about uh, someone lost and, uh, and, and wanted uh, a Modi. Um, and then the joke was, uh, but if you find him, we don't want him back. Um, do you think people in India have lost confidence in uh, their prime minister? Yeah, you see, he was caught between the two hard rocks. One with the nationalists, uh, fundamentalists, uh, religious fanatics, that went to the temples and went to the rivers and went into these religious uh, uh, rituals and uh, ceremonies without masks. And he was unable to stop them or tell them. It was almost like Trump talking to his people and Modi was equivalent in India. And now 
he's paying a dear price because his own um, basis of political uh, political support is now uh, withering away. And that support was there to support him. <coughs> but now that uh, people are dying, families are seeing struggling places to burial sites are not there. Like, you know, uh, they've not been able to support uh, he, their own people. And so Modi is now paying a political price. Uh, certainly he is at the stage right now that this uh, popular support that he had for the last four or five years is now quickly evaporating. Political capital is at a serious risk. It's it's interesting because India is the world's largest producer of vaccines, and uh, and and you know one would think that they'd be able to really ramp up production of the vaccines they've been authorized uh, to uh, to produce. What I can't remember which one. I guess it's the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that they've got a completely separate authorization to produce it, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, going very well, the vaccination rate. It's amazing how many countries around the world, including Canada, uh, likes of uh, the Saskatchewan government have airlifted oxygen from Canada to take uh, equipment, medical equipment, supplies. Uh, it, they've mobilized around the world to support businessmen, private and public have really made an effort to try to save India and uh, the, the uh, vulnerable population that is suffering right now at stage. It's going to take several months to, to stabilize, at least to get them on the right footing. But I think that uh, Modi has clearly now really understood. He wasn't even wearing masks until about two or three months ago. And he's now starting to wear masks. He's trying to control the public from going out in the marketplaces. And so the hospitals there are, um, uh, are really under siege. There are military hospitals set out right across uh, India. You have private public partnerships that have set up uh, centers that uh, anybody in the family, so if a family of three or four people have caught COVID, they mark them and they take them to the central zones to, to get some help. But uh, far from over, I think you can see Canadian government and many other governments have actually stopped flights from India and Pakistan as a result of this national catastrophe. Right next door is Nepal, and you sent me a, uh, a report from Kathmandu. Nepal, um, the uh, um, Tropical and Infectious Disease Hospital in the Nepali uh, capital of Kathmandu is packed. So packed that in some cases, two patients share one bed as a second COVID-19 wave overwhelms the country's health infrastructure. Health experts and frontline medicinal workers have described the situation as near apocalyptic as they share shortages of hospital beds and oxygen. The national vaccination campaign grinds almost to a halt and the numbers of dead are so high that mass cremations are being held. What's going on in Nepal? It's incredible. Again, uh, like I said earlier, that uh, countries like Nepal have been under the authority of the, the, the Indian army or the Indian government on one side, on the other side, you've got Pakistan in both uh, while healthcare systems were already under siege before COVID hit. But once COVID hit, it, it spared nothing there. And uh, if India could not support themselves, how could they possibly support Nepal? And so I think that the impact and then being close, uh, like the density population and the marginalized society, the, P, uh, the PPP for them to, to get that support was not there. And then obviously, you know, primary care was not there. So how can they get uh, even further care when the hospital beds were short, short supply, oxygen was short supply. And uh, all the doctors there, like if you look at how many patients they were serving, um, it, it's uh, to get out of this mess uh, requires a collective effort, private public partnership, but at a global scale to, 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 to put, stop, to stop this, uh, this, this uh, campaign of a major, uh, because if they don't stop it here, uh, how is the world going to live safely? Uh, so it is in the interest of the West to ensure that these hotspots, uh, they take action, collective action to ensure optimization to, to, to bring it under control. And then just last week, you sent me another article, uh, COVID-19, what went wrong in Singapore and Taiwan? Uh, you know, we all thought that Singapore and Taiwan 
we're near zero uh, in infections and had done such an incredibly good job, but it seems like uh, there's been a, a wave that has uh, taken off in both Singapore and Taiwan uh, and um, both places it's because the, uh, the governments it would appear have become complacent. And uh, you know, it sounds interesting in, uh, in Taiwan, it was all brought to one group of pilots that came into Taiwan and From China uh, Airlines and, and stayed in a hotel and, uh, and that ended up being a super spreader. And then uh, for some reason it got into uh, the Taiwanese uh, tea houses, which I understand are adult entertainment uh, venues. And you had people singing and drinking and coming into frequent contact with each other in an indoor setting. And it wasn't just one tea house, but it was all the tea houses on one street. And that became a large super spreader event. So it's complacency. It's an introduction just of a few people from the outside and they had a, a different variant. And then it is, uh, it is close contact in an indoor setting. Yeah, you know, um, Ryan, uh, the variant also has been in a changing mode, right? It's not the same variant that what it started with. And uh, somehow, you know, if you think that you're vaccinated, you think you're safe. And that's when the, the, the guards go down and I know many people that have had that mindset and they let the guards down. Even today in Toronto, when you go out to the countryside or if you go up uh, on trails and you walk down the streets in Port Credit, look at how many people are actually wearing their masks. Somehow they think that they're insulated that once they've got the, 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 you know, the, the, um, the injections, uh, the inoculations that they feel safe uh, I'm sorry to say that these kind of mindsets of people that they think that by taking the vaccinations, they're going to be safe. Um, this is the same story what took place in Taiwan and in Singapore. You can see the results of, for example, the likes of New Zealand or the Nordic countries. They have got much more uh, restrictive measures and the mindset. It boils down to education and it boils down to self-discipline of an individual. And I think that this, this discussion that we're having, I think we speak really broadly to everyone that they can't let their guards down. The next three months, the next three to six months are going to be very challenging if you're not going to be careful in Canada and around the world. You know, summer is here, good weather is here. And I think that uh, if people are not very careful, we will be into our third and fourth waves. And this time uh, it's going to overrun the, the healthcare systems uh, really, really uh, in a very difficult positions. I see doctors in Alberta already crying the blues. I see doctors in Manitoba sending patients in Ontario. This is just the beginning of summer. So can you imagine where this is going to lead? And but this, but, this but is uh, infections in, in, in Ontario, in BC and Quebec are coming down. And, uh, and so that appears, again, to be working where we've kept the restrictions up uh, and where uh, in Saskatchewan and Alberta restrictions were maybe too lax and or opened up too quickly, we've got these uh, roll-ups. But then, um, you know, Nizar, you sent me a really provocative uh, article um, quoting a, a vice provost of the Aga Khan University in Kenya that he wrote that it's estimated that 83% of all the vaccine shots worldwide have gone into the arms of high and upper middle income countries. Uh, the yes. disparity between wealthier and poorer nations um, goes well beyond vaccine access or availability. It's also in all the other um, you know, apparatuses uh, uh, we need to deal with COVID-19. So it's really been a, uh, a breakdown between the rich and poor in different countries, has it not? Absolutely. COVID has not spared anything and it's opened up all these wounds showing the disparities and the, uh, the equity between the rich and poor. And uh, the Aga Khan uh, University, the provost is quite right in his statistics showing that only 83% uh, vaccinations have gone to the, the upper class people and it's left the marginalized society. And the world is not going to solve this problem if it doesn't attack it co collectively with all the peoples of the world. And that's what I said earlier on, that it's very, very important that the leadership comes together, works together, 
and finding a way to ensure optimization of the results of this. If you look, President Biden has already started to show that the leadership that he's sharing all the access uh, um, vaccinations that he has, that he's shipping to other parts of the world, including India. And I think that beyond that, I think that uh, these countries are also making efforts. You look at Nigeria, look at Kenya, uh, look at Pakistan. They're making every effort to finding ways. Uganda, they're, they're put in a tall order of uh, priority of the health uh, economy, starting with to make sure that the next wave, next wave of action that comes into play a pandemic, that they should be ready with their own resources. So you can see that the pro host has made the statement. Uh, it's, it's provocating, but it's true that uh, the, the margin lies even in Canada. Look at the seniors, look at the population. How many did we lose in the first and second wave? We, we were not ready. And I think that our, our systems failed us and, and, and ultimately failed. Many lives were lost as a result of, of the gaps in, in, uh, in the systems that we had in the policies and the procedures that we had at local level and also at the international level. And at the international level, this is where the AKU has been foremost and working in, 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 in on the continent of Asia and Africa to ensure that uh, these gaps can be mitigated, at least in this uh, early case of in, in COVID, but even in the future, the investments is huge by AKU. Now, uh, you also mentioned that Turkey has announced a full lockdown in uh, their bid to halt uh, COVID surge. And uh, the numbers were pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, dramatic. They uh, logged 37,000 new COVID infections and 350 deaths. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, as Europe started reopening, other parts of the world uh, appear to be hitting a whole new uh, wave. What what do you think it is? It's 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 you know India, Brazil, um, Mexico, Turkey, are all hitting these big waves right now, and yet, as you point out, eighty three percent of all the vaccinations have been going to high and middle income countries. It's like yeah. we're leaving the poor developing world behind. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, this all will catch up again. We'll get into third and fourth wave. Like I said, summer is just around the corner and all these countries are uh, itching to open up their but market what can we economy. Do? What, what should with be done? And I think that uh, you remember our first uh, interview last year uh, in the COVID, uh, I think it was in April or May, and I stated that all the leadership has to be come together. This is a war, it's like a third world war. Many, many more lives are going to be lost this year, many more lives. And I said, until and unless they don't get their act together, this is not going to happen. And starting with the United Nations, the, uh, their uh, WHO, the, the arm of the uh, United Nations has made a very, very, uh, they made calls, they've asked countries to come together and make this uh, happen. Um, coming back to Turkey, uh, as you know, Turkey lies on, on the, the, the platform of East and West. So it's a gateway to Europe and gateway to Central Asia and Asia. Um, I think that uh, again, uh, they were all trying to save their economy. You know, we've spent billions and billions of dollars. You can add from the beginning of Confederation to now, how much money have you spent in these last one and a half years? We spent more money. How are we going to pay this debt? But these other countries don't have this money to be able to fighting these resources. Yeah. So you will see countries like Turkey pay a huge price. Either they're going to be paying a price on the economic front, or they're going to be paying a price on the on the healthcare side. So to find the right balance uh, is is going to be critical. But it really calls into question government and uh, and, and governance, as you said. And 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 then you sent me another. Article. I'm not sure whether you wrote this or someone else wrote it, but what it reads is, for many years, India has been billed as a China in waiting. The Indian tortoise has, however, in recent weeks come to be seen by many in the West as a Somalia in the making. I have friends who are convinced that the country is teetering and could be swept away by the COVID tsunami. It is truly the nadir of my calling as an Indophile. My submission is that the truth is somewhere in the middle. COVID has clearly highlighted the fact that India has oversold itself and needs to address some major deficiencies in governance. It is 
to if it's to fulfill its true potential. That said, India is very far from being Somalia. Um, and then you go on and you say that India has, since 2014, assertively nurtured a narrative that it is a superpower in the making. The country flexed its near superpower status, launching 104 satellites in a single launch. They've got nuclear capabilities and become heavily invested in the program to be self-reliant in missile development. Uh, but then it has an abysmal healthcare system that has tragically failed the public for decades and now in the most glaring fashion during the second COVID wave. A country that could send a woman to the moon seems incapable of distributing oxygen. India is a paradox. <laughs> Brian. Did you uh, write this? No, no, this was sent to me by a friend of mine. And uh, as I can tell you, uh, I pick on these things uh, very, very carefully and I send these out carefully. Um, I can tell you one thing, it is so correct that uh, India is, uh, is, is almost, uh, uh, Somalia in the making? Uh, you look, you have 400 dialects and you've got Sikhs on one side, you've got the Muslims, you've got the Christians, you've got uh, the Hindus, and then the central government is trying to find a balanced approach to solving the problem. You think it's really balanced? Like I said, the earlier quote from AKU, 83% of the upper class and everybody else has got their vaccinations. Uh, what about the less privileged people? And those people are the ones that lost their daily livings, their daily lives uh, in terms of making an income. Those are the ones that really need the support in the makings of making sure that they get vaccinated. And I think that what this really demonstrates that uh, COVID has, has clearly shown the light that India has a lot of work to do before it can be called a superpower. And I think it needs the help of the support, not within just India, but outside of India to ensure, because there are many expats uh, that live outside of India that are Indian origin. And I think that if you look at the likes of the Fortune 500, there is true leadership. They look at Google, the president of Google, the CEO of Google, the likes of Microsoft. These are all guys from India and they are mobilizing now, going back to India and to ensure that this is, you know, this is, um, this is saving uh, you can win, you can get independence. You can, you know, all these countries have got independence in the last 60, 70 years, but have they really taken advantage of their resources at home to making a success of their countries? And I think they've got to look at beyond, just not just in within the region, within, within India, but also their neighbors and finding ways to work peacefully and creating a trading block, just like what Canada has done with the U US and making those trading blocks and making equity for all the peoples, how do you make that work? You know, I'd already mentioned to you in that a couple of interviews back that the democratic principles uh, are, are, you know, what works here may not work there. Uh, and I sent an article to that effect or a video to that effect as well to show you that it's so important that how governance is created and to ensure that everybody is equally treated. Um, and I think that uh, for the most part, COVID is now going to accelerate all the gaps that we have been shown. I think that human race will make every effort to make, uh, make it a better place. And that's again, a big word called hope, that with hope, we can take this and harness the, the true values of our, our survivability together as a human race. We're chatting with Nizar Mawani this evening, a uh, global businessman uh, who's an expert on what's going on around the world, particularly in, uh, in some of the developing world, uh, India and, uh, and the Middle East, uh, Africa, where he's uh, done work uh, most recently uh, developing hotels and mixed-use developments in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Southern Africa, not South Africa, but Southern Africa. Um, Nizar, thank you so much for your, uh, your thoughts. We're going to take a break and come back more with Nizar. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Canadian economy and debt and, uh, and, uh, and GDP growth. Uh, stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Nizar Mawani, an international businessman, and I'm really doing a canvas 
of, uh, of the world uh, from a COVID-19 standpoint and getting Nazar's opinion. We've talked about uh, some real challenges in India and Nepal, in uh, Singapore and, uh, and Taiwan, where you know, we thought things were solved and, and it would appear that complacency has uh, allowed it to come back uh, big time. Uh, Nazar, I just read an article this morning about uh, Australia, where uh, you know, their concern is even though they've done a great job, because they've done such a good job, people aren't taking vaccines. And now they're wor worried that they're not going to have any international travel. Uh, and tourism and business is so critically important to them. Uh, so it really appears that, you know, a lot of countries have had some problems. And so the question, I guess, other than the public health, which we spent the first couple of minutes uh, of our, our, our conversation talking about, uh, the other big topic is the economy and what's going to happen. And, you know, it's interesting, you sent me, as I mentioned a couple of times, an article a day or so, it seems, uh, which I really enjoy. So, so please keep doing it. Um, but you sent me almost, you sent me two articles that were almost completely opposite in their view. And so I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested in your point of view. You know, one was that uh, the Canadian economy nears full recovery um, and, uh, and really a run of surprising strength, validating expectations that activity will soon return to pre-pandemic levels. So one that was extremely positive on what was happening. And then another one that uh, an expert warns 30% drop in the S&P 500 is highly probable. So what is it? Are we going to have excellent uh, growth or are we going to have a crash and a recession? It all depends on leadership. And I think that uh, the pressure uh, to the federal government and the provincial governments is enormous. I mean, you can imagine the amount of money that they have spent and some of it is not appropriately spent. And let's face it, right? It's not going to be perfect. They didn't come with an operational book. They got thrown into this situation. They made the best case scenario for it. But I suspect that our liberal, um, uh, the, the liberal government will also lose some political capital here. Uh, they could have taken some advantages. Uh, and I believe that what will make us or break us is going to be the pressure of the people to ensure that we don't fail and we don't get into a severe recession. And I think that uh, the key uh, aspect of this is policies uh, on, on interest rates, on, um, on, on debt and how it's going to be, how you're gonna tax um, the, 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 your way out of it because somehow we have to pay for it. And from what I'm hearing is that, for example, the, um, our, uh, taxes that we pay right now at the gas station or uh, the, the taxation level uh, is going to go up. And obviously it is going to go up, but how much is it going to go up and how is it going to impact? Right now, one of the key fundamentals in Canada is a real estate. It's just on fire. Look at the prices on, on wood and uh, steel and uh, the labor costs are just skyrocketing. Uh, how are, get the, how are they going to slow that down? How is it going to become affordable? And you've got almost a million people at the doorsteps of our, uh, our, our borders uh, itching to, to, to make their way in because they've been approved. They are actually legal Im uh, immigration uh, processes have gone through, but because of COVID they've been held back and they've not been allowed to come in. If they come in, where are they go? How are we going to provide these houses? I think so the government will need to address uh, policies and procedures to ensure, uh, look, we have run out of, uh, we've run out of land. Can you believe that? We have land in Canada, but we've run out of land that is uh, got enough um, uh, uh, utilities and water. Um, recently, uh, Collingwood just announced stop of all the developments. Why? Because it's run out of water. So, I think that we've got to get our act together at a municipal level. We've got to get our act together at a provincial level and at a federal level. But this and is I a real challenge, isn't it? Because you know, you're talking about that we've got high levels of debt and, uh, and, and to stave off, uh, uh, starve off uh, a, a recession, uh, we need to keep interest rates low. But if we keep interest rates low, um, we number one risk inflation. And number two, what we do is we risk this housing boom uh, continuing uh, in an unprecedented level. And so, you know, a normal reaction right now would be to raise interest rates, um, to caution people against buying homes. Um, but we can't do that when so many people are still out of work and we've got businesses that are still closed, et cetera. So it's, you know, what do you do? The government itself is caught between the two hard rocks. If they 
increase the interest rates, they risk losing their political capital. I have my doubts that uh, any but government- Raising the interest rates is not a decision for the government. That's a decision for the central banks. Of course, but you know, and the central, central bank banks is- Worldwide effectively. Yeah, with central banks or worldwide, they will have to sit together and make that decision. I can tell you one thing, United States and Canada is not going to take that risk of losing uh, or increasing their, 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 you see the central governments are uh, stand alone and make their policies, but really they're driven by the political, they're driven by people. They make the decisions in the government. And I think that uh, the governments will do everything in their power, uh, at least in the Western world, not to increase interest rates. Look where Japan is. Japan has been having low interest rates for the last 20 years. Yeah. And I think that we are going in that direction because we don't want to risk. Okay, so, so keep interest rates low. Um, the housing market is going to increase almost in an unprecedented level. Um, and uh, we risk the, 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 um, the economy overheating. Um, so do you think there's gonna be a recession coming or a crash? I think that if the, if the stock markets for any reason crash or the currencies crash for any reason, you know, the financial, we, we've got a lot of stockpile of cash in, in the Western world, in, including North America. So there is enough cash out there in the public side and the government will find its way, um, maybe uh, find policies and procedures to ensure, for example, uh, working and making uh, approval processes much e easier. It takes today a year and a half to get approvals for any development to take place. And that's crazy in today's day and time. And the excuse they have is all oh, because of COVID, our offices are closed, whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is right now, if you drive it through market-driven success, in other words, let's say in, um, take our Mississauga or, or Peel region, and we open up all the doors of, of, of development and make it faster, then I think that the market will stabilize the pricing by itself. So your answer to the, the housing crisis, uh, the housing price issue right now is increased supply. And the way to, the best increased supply is to reduce the impediment of municipal uh, um, building permit and zoning approvals and, and make that far quicker. And you know, you're, it's right, it's, it's, it's crazy that it takes so long to get approvals. When you think about, uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed gave us a vaccine in half the time that everyone else thought it would take uh, initially, and we can't get buildings approved. Um, you know, there's something wrong with this. Yeah, and you know, then the costs, right? Like the disparities, some markets you're going to, it's reasonable pricing for all of these approvals. In some areas you go, it's just like crazy. So how are you going to beat the affordable housing if your cost structures are so high? And then also looking at the prices of lumber. We produce, we have so much lumber in our own country. Why are we paying so much more? So I think uh, supply has to increase in all of these areas and finding ways to be self-sufficient. You know, Trump was right. Nationalism to a certain degree, we need to provide for ourselves at home first before we can go outside. And I think that uh, anything coming from outside in terms of supply chain, we have to see where, where do we need those products and services to facilitate so that our cost doesn't go higher. People are paying, look, look at the prices of houses today. It's just going through the roof. Yeah, and, no, and it's, it's not crazy. Just, you know, you know, it's not just so, that. So, you Logistics. know, in the United States, we've had this uh, massive stimulus bill, and now they're talking about an incre incredibly large infrastructure bill. So government spending like we haven't ever seen before, maybe since uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, you know, even uh, they're saying more stimulus than after the world financial crisis in uh, 08, 09. Um, and, um, you know, Canada is not that uh, extensive, but, but pretty, you know, biggest deficit ever, biggest debt ever. Um, is that going too far? I think uh, they don't have options. They will have to not only go into the infrastructure, but I must say, Brian, the area of the new world order on the health economy, and I'm talking about not just the country nationally, but globally, collectively, they, you know, just like 20 years ago, they had this, uh, uh, after the 9-11, they created uh, Homeland Security. You know, Homeland Security created thousands of jobs and uh, uh, the whole new economy was designed on that, right? 
Yep. And if you look at now on the health side, I think there's going to be a huge amount of money that the governments need to spend on healthcare throughout globally, collectively together to ensure that we've got it right across the board. And I think so infrastructure is, is one way of spending their way out. Otherwise, recession is imminent. Nizar, um, what do you think about currencies? The Canadian dollar has done well of late. Um, and you've sent me a bunch of things on Bitcoin re recently. Do you yeah. think Bitcoin's going to become sort of like the reserve currency? I think so. And, you know, I think if you look at what Ethiopia has done recently, some of these developing countries, uh, it's going to be a, a game changer for the developing countries uh, once uh, their governments start using it through their central banks to ensuring, look, the interest rates they're borrowing for businesses, for real estate or for uh, business, it's very, very difficult to do business in those markets unless you have your own capital. And um, I think that if, if the developing countries are given the same opportunities of development, I think the, the game changer here is going to be cryptocurrency. And I think cryptocurrency is it's at its infancy stage and you will see a lot of uh, uh, failures in certain uh, products because there is a vast uh, arena of this playing field. But I think that some of these, demo, these developing countries have shown a lot of interest and it will help their population. In Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, yes. So using Bitcoin as uh, the reserve currency rather than the US dollar. Absolutely. And that's a serious risk. That's amazing. Yeah. And the other, uh, another issue that you sent me that I find kind of intriguing is, uh, is an idea of the lost generation of family businesses, that so many family businesses are being dramatically negatively impacted by the pandemic and that they've, you say, uh, you know, the, the strongest have been brought to their knees. Um, it's going to be a tragedy, all these businesses that go bankrupt, Nizar. In, in the Western world, you are seeing a catastrophic loss of a lot of uh, family businesses. And, you know, we, we've been in Canada for more than 40 years and been fortunate in many respects, but there are many immigrant families that started out. Those are the economic engines of Canada, like, you know, gas station owners, uh, laundromats, uh, variety stores, all those stores are disappearing. And, you know, they have to change and use the technology to their advantage. But in their families uh, that have got young blood that is transforming their local businesses, uh, that is giving them the survival more to take them to the next level. But uh, ordinarily people that did not have education and were running these variety stores or laundromats or garages, they're all disappearing. Just look around us and see who's out there to support them. And then the other thing is that they haven't been able to capitalize and get government support. You know, the government support have gone to, to many, many businesses, but these small businesses needed a lot more help. And, you know, that's the economic engine of most countries. If you look in developing countries, these are the emerging countries. Why are they being successful? Because they've got hundreds and thousands of people that are uh, earning, their, their, their entrepreneurs, right? And they're surviving and they're running their businesses on a day-to-day basis. But those are the economic engines in the developing world. Here, education, um, the, the digital economy, um, the broad spectrum of, of, of big, big companies that are taking advantage, but the small guys, if they don't retool themselves in education, if they don't invest in, in technology, uh, they're going to be left behind. We're chatting tonight with Nazar Mawani, who is a uh, international global businessman, a very smart guy, a well-read individual, keeps me abreast of what's going on in the world. Uh, we're doing a canvas of uh, COVID-19 issues, uh, both uh, from a public health standpoint uh, in the developing world, uh, as well as uh, economic issues. We're going to take a break and come back. And I think, Nazar, you've got a couple of suggestions on political capital and governance. Um, stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real pleasure uh, to chat again with Nizar Mawani, who uh, is uh, one of the smartest, uh, well-read individuals that I've had the pleasure of interacting with, both in politics as well as in business. 
Uh, he uh, has uh, developed real estate across Canada. He's developed real estate in uh, Southern Africa. He's uh, done business in the Middle East. He's uh, traveled extensively around the world. He's got uh, um, uh, branches into the Indian subcontinent. Uh, so he knows what's going on, particularly in the developing world and someone that I really rely on to keep me abreast of what's going on in the developing world. And, and Nizar, what we've seen is a bunch of issues. We've seen some issues with uh, people that declared war, uh, declared victory over COVID uh, too early. We've seen issues with uh, uh, governments that have not had uh, good public health uh, measures um, without vaccination uh, measures. Um, with uh, um, letting the guards down too quickly, with complacency, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we've seen problems in the past uh, with uh, governments uh, as well. And you think that what this has done is it's going to create a demand for new governance. Is that correct? Definitely. Uh, I think that the, every government has been put to notice. They have to retool themselves and rewrite the script of the, you know, the 2050 or 2030 programs that they have in play, but they've got to take care of the problem now. And only now, if they don't, then they not only risk leaving a legacy, a negative legacy for themselves, but for their political party for a long period of time to come to. What are some of the changes that you think need to be made? I think that the first uh, call of order would be the healthcare. And I think they need to listen to the scientists, uh, not just global, uh, locally, but globally, and to understand uh, where we stand on the healthcare today and uh, where we stand 10, 20 years down the road and have a game plan ready for it. Because you I think there's gonna be another pandemic that's gonna come or COVID-19 is gonna be staying, uh, hanging around with us for a while or what? I think COVID-19 is here for a while. And I think that the next uh, pandemic that comes in We've got to have uh, better resources and tools to our, uh, our uh, position. Otherwise, we risk losing our economies altogether. We've got lucky so far, but we can't let our guards down for the next, uh, okay. like I said, three to six I've, months. We've only got a few minutes left, so healthcare is number one. What's number two? Number two is that uh, we've got to look at economic policies. Um, I think we've got to focus on local manufacturing and making sure that the uh, that we are giving our own input locally to ensure optimization. So our dependency from outside uh, should be uh, not- So less globalization, more nationalism in manufacturing and uh, supply true. chains that are uh, more local of nature, national in nature rather than uh, global in nature. Correct. Okay. And then the, and the third three. one is, number th three is the risks of our energy supply. So energy sub, uh, supply is very critical to us. We're very much dependent on the US to a certain degree. We are locked horns with our own provincial partners. We need to unlock those, those resources to ensure that energy supply within Canada is foremost priority because it's a national threat. Okay. Um, and we've got you know these pipeline issues. Um, uh, that we're trying to build some liquid uh, national natural gas uh, pipeline to uh, to uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we've got a uh, pipeline that uh, Michigan is threatening to uh, close down that supplies a lot of what we need in uh, in eastern Canada. So there's some big issues in energy, and we could do a whole show on that. We probably should, uh, but let's uh, skip that. Is there a uh, another one, or is that your three? No, I think that uh, there is more. Uh, and, and the fourth one, I think that the government has to look for uh, better partnerships, trading partnerships, particularly with developing country, forging first and foremost with education as a platform. So we can harness relationships, support the developing country, but also bring back value to us. Uh, for example, agriculture. We are almost a foremost authority in the world in agriculture. How come we're not uh, exporting that knowledge uh, through education and equipment supply and technological supply to the developing countries so they can become more self-sufficient. And I think that the government needs to play a central role in that direction. And I think it'll benefit Canada overall. And then the, 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 the fifth point I have is logistics. Uh, logistics hinges a lot of our challenges and COVID clearly demonstrated that. So logistics, uh, within town, within cities, 
and again, throughout our country, we need to improve our logistics. You go to Europe today, or you go to Southeast Asia today, I think Canada is left way behind. I think we need to really find ways of finding uh, economic ways of uh, uh, traveling and as well as of also logistics of goods and services to make it easier flow within Canada and also United States. Nazar Mawani, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us your point of view on so many different topics in regards to COVID-19, uh, both from a public health standpoint, as well as a debt and economy standpoint, and how you think that uh, you know governments have been challenged um, and uh, we need to uh, to change some governance and some uh, some um, economic and 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 practical uh, policies the government has if they're going to step up to the plate um, uh, that gets us out of this catastrophe that we've gone through. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Well, that's our show for today. I'm on every Monday through Friday at seven o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at uh, www.saga960am.ca or you can get all my podcasts and video casts on uh, my website, briancrombie.com. Uh, videos on YouTube and podcasts on Audible, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody. Thank you.